Right. So we have embarked on a sermon series called Seven Steps to Grow as a Disciple, covering the vital things that we must believe and do to mature in our friendship with Jesus. Last week, Murray explained how we have certainty that we are saved, which is the foundation on which our faith is built. This week, I get to talk about how we get daily nourishment from God's Word, the Bible, which is the food of our spiritual life, the Bible as baby bread. So let's start at the beginning. What is the Bible? Well, it's a book, the best-selling book of all time, in fact, and it's actually a library of 66 smaller books written by at least 40 different people over a span of many hundreds of years. Those books include many types of literature, prophecy, narrative, poetry, letters, wisdom literature, history, and so on. And while these books are so diverse, they all work together and build on each other to tell a unique and unified story that is strikingly different from the stories being told in any other ancient literature. As Christians, we believe that the whole collection of biblical books, the whole Bible, is God's message to the world. The Bible was written by human authors, but those human authors were guided and inspired by God to communicate what he intended. That makes this a unique book. This is God's book. That means it is not just something we read for interest, or for information. We read it to be influenced by it. The Bible is more than words on a page. They are living words. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So even though in one sense the words of the Bible are just ink on paper, they are also God's living, powerful communication to us, capable of doing spiritual surgery on our hearts. So that's what the Bible is. But why did God give it to us? What is the purpose of it? I think that the most important reason was to make himself knowable. The whole overarching story of the Bible reveals that he is a good and loving God who longs for a relationship with us and that he has a plan to rescue us from our rebellious self-destruction. In the eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus, that rescue plan is fully revealed. In the person of Jesus, God became human. God lived as one of us to reveal his character in a way that we could understand. He allowed himself to be falsely accused and killed to defeat sin and death so that he could welcome us back into a loving relationship with him. In Paul's letter to the Colossian church, he says, For God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. This is a beautiful summary statement. The whole Bible is ultimately showing us, is ultimately God showing us what he is like and his plan to rescue us. This is such good news, and God intended it to be the food of our souls. These words about our Creator and His plan for us are meant to be sustenance for our spirits. Jesus said so when He was fasting in the wilderness and His enemy Satan tried to tempt Him to break faith by using His divine authority to satisfy His hunger. Jesus said to Him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the scriptures are meant to be our spiritual food. Do you know what the word hangry means? So it's a combination of hungry and angry, right? And it's used to describe how not yourself you get when you haven't eaten in a while. In my experience, if I go for a couple of weeks with no contact with the Bible, I also start becoming a different person, a weaker person. I get more fearful, more selfish, more self-pitying. I feel more protective of my comfort, more hurried, less loving. And honestly, I think it's because my spirit is hangry, right? It's in a calorie deficit. My soul needs nourishment from God's word. But God's word is not only intended to just eat us out, to just keep us alive like survival rations. 
It is meant to grow and mature our spirits, teaching us to make right decisions. When someone first puts their trust in Jesus, spiritually, they're like a little seed that's just started to germinate. So life has begun, and that's wonderful, but it's not meant to stay like that, right? God intends that seed to grow into a tree. I'm sure we can all think of people who have the body of an adult, but the emotions of a child. Someone like this, <laughs> someone whose emotional development stopped somewhere in childhood, and now they just don't accept an adult level of responsibility. In the same way, we need to grow up spiritually. The writer of Hebrews has some sharp words to say about this. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature and who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Reading and applying the scriptures is how we progress from spiritual babyhood to spiritual maturity. Meditating on God's standards is what trains us to recognize the difference between right and wrong, as this passage says. So to briefly summarize this, why did God give us the Bible? The Bible makes God known and draws us to himself. It sustains us, it matures us, and trains us in righteousness. This is the spiritual food that God gives us to eat. And like physical food, we need it regularly. Our spirits starve without it. So, if the Bible is spiritual food, how do we eat it? I'm going to suggest three practical steps that we can all take to get more nourishment from the Bible. Firstly, pretty stretch, isn't it? We have to recognize that reading the Bible is a discipline. That means it can be hard. Can I have a show of hands? How many of you have ever felt that reading the Bible was hard work? And let's have another show of hands. Has reading the Bible ever blessed you? Well, I find that comforting, don't you? Like exercise or learning a musical instrument, reading the Bible is not naturally easy. But it does get easier and more delightful with practice. Anyone who has learned an instrument or an athletic skill knows that practicing can feel like drudgery, especially at the beginning. But as you develop the skill, you also get to experience the freedom and joy of that skill. You don't get the joy without the discipline. The habit of reading the Bible has to be built in the same way. So you may not always feel like it. Self-discipline means denying your desire to do one thing by choosing to do something else. I want to do that, but I'm going to do this. It's when you choose to act according to your values, not your feelings. Hebrews says that no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. We know that letting our actions be governed by the feeling of the moment is short-sighted. Just like you will not keep a job if you only go to work when you're in the mood. <laughs> but this passage promises a wonderful long-term payoff, a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who submit to the regular discipline of reading scripture. Where does that righteousness and peace come from? Certainly not from ink on paper, right? It comes from God's spirit changing our spirit. Turning up to read the Bible exposes you to the transforming force of God. So we need to read the Bible even when we don't feel like it. But the comforting flip side is, you don't need to feel anything to read the Bible. You do not have to generate feelings of joy and peace and amazement when you read the Bible. If you encounter God's word without enjoying it, that doesn't mean it didn't work. The emotional high that can sometimes come from reading scripture is not an end in itself. Jesus is not a drug. God can and does give people the light in his words 
and a desire to read them, but that's a special blessing. It's not an all-the-time guarantee. When Bruce was a new Christian, he had an intense hunger for the Bible. He loved reading it. He couldn't get enough of it, and he devoured the whole thing, cover to cover. And then things calmed down, right, Bruce? And he's never had quite the same experience again. But that's okay. Even though his Bible reading is now driven more by habit than by an overwhelming passion, Bruce has continued to be strengthened and guided and encouraged by the Bible ever since. True story? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes I encounter Jesus in an emotional way when I read the Bible. But other times, most of the time, I come to the Bible feeling one way and I leave feeling the same way. But my feelings are not the point. Stick with it and you will be changed. The Holy Spirit can work on you whether you feel it or not. By bringing your focused attention and a teachable attitude, regardless of your mood, you can trust God to transform your heart and your mind with his words. So let's get practical. With any discipline, the hardest part is each time you start. That moment you decide to open your Bible is the hardest part. You can help yourself by removing the obstacles that make it even harder for you to get there. Make starting your Bible time as frictionless as possible so you need minimal willpower to get there. Different members of our church family have different strategies for this. Wesley has programmed his phone to automatically open the Version Bible app for the first time he unlocks his phone in the morning. He may have thought he was going for Facebook, but he gets the Bible. <laughs> Linda always has her Bible time in the lounge, and she starts by listening to worship music and by reading the word for today. Leslie listens to Nikki Gumbel's Bible in one year devotionals while doing her morning routine. My mum drinks her morning coffee in bed, thanks dad, while praying through a Lectio 365 devotional. I have recently been spending my daily train commute listening to devotionals on the Sermon on the Mount by the Bible Project. And David and I sometimes do a study together from a book called Search the Scriptures. And there will be so many other examples of how people in this room make the Bible a valued part of their routine. But a common thread that you might have noticed is that most of us decide what to focus on by using some kind of tool. A reading plan or a devotional series, like the Bible in One Year, Lecture 365, the YouVersion Bible app, Word for Today, Bible Project, or Search the Scriptures. Using a plan is such a good idea because it takes all the decision making out of what you're going to read that day. It also exposes you to a wider range of scripture than you might gravitate towards if left to your own devices. And it gives you a starting point to your reflections on that scripture. And that leads me to the second practical step I want to encourage, which is to use tools to understand what you were reading. Another show of hands, have you ever encountered something in the Bible that just seemed bizarre? <laughs> Me too. And that is to be expected. Scripture is inspired by God, but it is also ancient, right? Written in languages we do not speak, written in a cultural context that we have never experienced. Of course, there will be barriers to us understanding the author's intentions. The Bible is foreign to us. Now, I grew up reading the Bible, this Bible, in fact. Who wouldn't love a Bible that pretty, right? But I basically took the Bible and all its strangeness for granted because I encountered it so much so early. And it's a wonderful thing to grow up with the Bible, but it does mean that I have to be careful. Christians like me can sometimes get to feel overly familiar with Scripture and forget how far it is. If we forget that the Bible is ancient, Middle Eastern, communal literature, we are in danger of reading it through a modern, Western, personal lens. We tend to impose our own agendas on the text, seek specific answers for our personal problems, and we can assume that whatever we see at face value is God's direct message to us as individuals. That way of approaching scripture is not what the biblical authors had in mind. And if that's our approach, we can sometimes miss out on what the authors were really trying to communicate. We need to read the Bible 
on its own terms as the authors intended, paying attention to the context. Don't misunderstand me. God's spirit is active as we study the Bible, and he is the great teacher who leads us in all truth. He can and he does reveal truth to us by highlighting how specific verses relate to our lives. But what I want to emphasize is, reading the Bible is not meant to be inspiration roulette. Okay? It is not wise to pull lovely sounding verses out of context, or to ask God for a direct answer to a problem and randomly point to a verse and try to figure out God's will from that verse. Okay? It doesn't work like that. Jesus didn't do that. We don't need to do that. The Bible is so much more than a grab bag of inspirational quotes. And it's not going to give you step-by-step -step instructions on what to do with your life. That's not what it's designed to do. What it is designed to do is to tell the cosmic story. The story of how a good and loving God is reconciling a rebellious world to himself through a promised rescuer. And by revealing God's nature and God's rescue plan, it also reveals what we need to believe and the moral guidelines by which we are to live. So we have this text that is both hard for us to understand because it is foreign to us, right? And extremely important to understand because it's God's message to us. This is where we need something called biblical scholarship. Bible scholars are the people who professionally study the design and language of the Bible to figure out what it means. Ever since we have had the Bible, these people have been using their gifts to strengthen the body of Christ by helping us figure out the meaning of the Bible. They are the reason we even have translations of the Bible in our own languages. Their studies have made a foreign text accessible to the rest of us. And two of the most helpful tools that they have produced of Bible commentaries and guided study questions. Now, I'm just making this point to encourage you. Don't shy away from tools that can help you understand the Bible. Commentaries and study guides are part of God's gift to the church. They help us read the Bible well. And if you want some examples of places you can go, these are some of the best and most reputable commentary platforms and study resources that you can access online for free. They all work a bit differently and have different things to offer, so you might want to spend some time playing around with them to see what's most helpful to you. But we'll also make sure that the links are included in the midweek email. My final practical step to get nourishment from God's word is to digest it. When you digest food, it gets incorporated into your body and becomes part of you, right? Likewise, when you digest a new idea, you incorporate it into your worldview and it changes who you are. The same thing needs to happen with the Bible. The book of James says, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says, otherwise you are only fooling yourselves. So whatever we learn from scripture needs to become real in our lives. Otherwise, James says, we are only fooling ourselves. So how do we take the truths we encounter in God's word and make them tangible in our lives? How do you digest it so that it becomes part of you? There are many practical ways to do this. I'm going to give you one example. One tool that can help you see how to apply scripture is this acronym, SPEC. As you read a passage, you can ask yourself, does this reveal any sin to confess or guard against? Any promise to believe, any example to follow, any command to obey, or any knowledge about God. Okay? Sin, promise, example, command, knowledge. There's about to be chocolate on the line, just warning you. <laughs> Would anyone like to recite them in re re reward for chocolate? Anyone? David wants to save you from embarrassment. David, <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll give you one more glimpse, okay? 
need to be reprinted because they're smudgy for some reason. So anyway, don't worry about um, don't worry about having to take a picture. Now you won't necessarily find an answer for all of those letters in every passage you read. But you will almost certainly get at least one application point out of it. At least one of those letters in the acronym you'll find an answer for. And if you take that one thing on board, that is enough. Once you have identified the things you're taking away, you can give them back to God in prayer. Thank him for teaching you and ask for his help to do what you've learned. And then you need to think about how you're going to make this concrete. In other words, what you're going to do about it. Remember, we cannot just listen to God's word. We must do what it says. Otherwise, we are fooling ourselves. This is where accountability is gold. God never meant us to walk the Christian journey alone. Having people to talk to about what you're learning from Scripture and who expect you to apply it in your life will make those learnings be so much more likely to stick. And that is exactly what a growth group is meant to be. I was in a growth group with Leslie, Lindsay, and Annalise last year, and we worked through a few chapters of 1 John together. We encouraged each other to apply what we were learning about forgiveness, love for others, and not being controlled by fear. It was also a wonderful group for support and prayer, and just straight up friendship. So if you're not currently in a growth group, I highly recommend it. Alright, that's my quick plug for growth groups. Here's our brief recap. Why did God give us the Bible? To reveal his nature and his rescue plan. To sustain our spirits. To grow us in maturity. How do we get nourishment from the spiritual food? Through discipline. Regular reading, regardless of feelings, will bring a harvest of transformation. Through the use of tools. The Bible is foreign, but commentaries make it accessible. And through digestion. Asking the right questions and applying what you learn to your life. Let's put this into action. We're going to make this real by spending 10 minutes applying the SPEC acronym to a short passage of scripture, just the first three verses of Psalm number one. So using the Bibles in front of you, if you could turn to page 442, you will find Psalm 1. Dad, can I get you to read out the first three verses of Psalm 1? Oh, <laughs> the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Thank you. So at our tables, let's discuss this passage and using the SPEC acronym, let's see what application points we can find. We'll spend 10 minutes doing 